I'm back again at the Learning Without Frontiers conference. I was here last year with uh, the Labour MP Tom Watson when we were uh, both in opposition, uh, but now I'm in government, so I've got to be slightly more responsible, I guess. Uh, but I wanted to come again this year because I think this is a fantastic conference. Uh, I want to congratulate Graham Brown Martin on the way he pulls this together, even if he has done this very odd thing of uh, putting the speakers in the round so that uh, we've got to move about a bit, feel slightly uncomfortable, feel like I'm at the old Vic doing Alan Aitborn, but there you go, I'll try and get um, uh, through it. Uh, the website of uh, the Learning Without Frontiers conference says it's a conference for uh, disruptive uh, thinkers, which is another reason uh, why I wanted to come. I like uh, disruptive people. Uh, and I think the hallmark of a disruptive thinker is somebody who recognises change uh, and also somebody who embraces change. And that's what makes people like Graham uh, and no doubt the people in this room exciting people to discuss issues with uh, and to learn things from. Uh, and I think we do live in an age of disruptive technology. I think disruptive technology is a good thing. Uh, and I think we should employ the same principle when we talk about disruptive technology to recognise how it's disrupting things uh, and to embrace the changes it brings. Uh, because our kids certainly do. Uh, the term digital native has been coined to describe those now in their late teens, perhaps, who have grown up around the technology changes that still appear new and exciting to people of my advancing middle age. Uh, and each generation becomes more and more native. The rise of the smartphone, the tablet, the permanent internet are still relatively new phenomena, but each generation knows more than the last and is embracing ever new and newer technology than the generation that's gone before it. And that's a huge challenge, I think, for policymakers, the kind of questions that we've got to ask about how we equip our kids with the skills they need to work in a world of such huge and fast change. How can we expect our teachers to adapt and be comfortable with the newest technologies? How on earth can you provide the kind of financial support for such an environment where new technology models come on the market every year? One option is to do nothing. Uh, and I hasten to add that is not a council of despair. When I talk to some of our leading lights in the games industry, they tell me that they got into gaming by having access to a BBC Micro. Sometimes this was in the school, but sometimes it was at home. But the main impression I get is that these were people who were self-taught who had the chance and the opportunity to mess around with technology. So a lot of kids will uh, embrace and adapt technology with no help from me or indeed from their school. And in fact, I was struck by an article in The Guardian by Charles Arthur, their technology editor, last year. I think Charles is here today. I think he's going to speak later. I think he's hot-footed it from Las Vegas, so he's probably as up-to-date as anyone in this conference. Uh, and he made the point that most kids are hugely far ahead of their teachers in terms of understanding uh, and using technology. A lot of them have smartphones, but a lot just explore on computers at school, at home and in the library. It's a kind of modern version of asking your kids to program the video, which is as far as I got in terms of being technologically ahead of my parents. So that's why I asked people like Charles Arthur, as well as David Yanton, who tells me he's grown a beard in mourning for the Australian defeat in the Ashes, and I think you'll be wearing that beard for many years to come, David. And Ray Maguire, who's speaking behind me because I have eyes in the back of my head, uh, to come to a round table which I held at the Department of Business at the end of last year. I wanted to look at ways in which we could harness uh, the power and opportunities of some of our big games companies based here, Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft, but also homegrown companies and small firms, to help engage kids with technology to try and address this problem uh, that uh, the most advanced technology will be found uh, in the workplace and in video games developers, companies and things like that rather than necessarily in the school. That if you want to stretch the kids who are most interested in technology, funnily enough, you'll find it quite difficult to do that in school, which is not a criticism of schools, I hasten to add, but just a recognition uh, of the reality of what technology is like today. There, has be, there have been some initiatives. The eSkills, uh, which is the sector skills council for the computer and software industry, set up a computer clubs for girls, an online computer club, which was 
apparently hugely successful in transforming the way 10 to 14 year old girls think about technology. It's an online resource that provided educational IT activities, helping to spark young people's interest in technology. And I also understand that Derek Robertson and Dawn Halibone are speaking later, both of whom I'm told have successfully introduced the Nintendo DS to the classroom, resulting in students becoming more confident in using technology. And that's all great, but I still think there's more that we can be doing. The opportunity is enormous and the potential is even greater. There are at least 13 million games consoles in the home offering potential learning platforms. What is more, these are increasingly connected, which means there's an opportunity for a really collaborative approach to learning and knowledge sharing. When we include handheld devices, that opportunity and potential becomes compelling. So we know we can deliver great clubs, and by getting uh, kids to collaborate with each other, we can also get mass. And I was inspired by what I heard at the round table, and I'm keen to see what we can get off the ground. The education system is still uh, are an incredibly important asset. Uh, the ages of 11 to 14 are important in terms of eventual careers, and although kids do not decide on the career they want to pursue, they do tend to rule some careers out at this point. The Department for Education has launched a three-year campaign aimed at telling students, parents and others of career options that STEM subjects can lead to. But we also need to hold on to the idea of getting kids exposed to businesses and industry professionals, which is why I want to work with the games industry to continue the already excellent work in evidence in engaging directly with both teachers and students. I'll give you one example, and they come up all the time. This is an example that I stumbled across only yesterday, uh, something called Young Rewired State, uh, which works with young people around hack days and challenges which brought young developers, entrepreneurs, and the open data community together. At the last event in the summer, a team of 15-year-olds came up with a winning concept that won, uh, won the competition, which is the concept of the social library, a way of using online technology to embed our libraries in the online worlds we all now inhabit. And I've asked the new government skunk works to work with these young people in the wider community to develop the concept as part of our commitment to the big society. There's also a lot more work to be done to give teenagers the formal skills they need to work in the games industry and other industries like it. I've received lots of ideas about how we could take this forward, such as the idea of a flexible system of high-level freelance apprenticeships, where an apprentice would gather modules of education, training and work experience to get skilled and qualified, allowing small businesses to take on apprentices only for short projects. And for graduate and postgraduate study, we're looking at how we can help make sure that the games courses are fit for purpose. One interesting suggestion, again, that I've come across was a simplified version of golden handcuffs where employers might be interested in recruiting someone they then help put through the right course for the job and in return the student agreed to work for that company, say, for a couple of years. To underpin this work, we've asked Ian Livingstone and Alex Hope with the support of Nesta and Skillset to do a report into the skills needed for school leavers and graduates to fully engage with the UK's world-class video games and visual effects industries. The review will report in the next few weeks, but we're also beginning to see some quite worrying messages from the research in terms of uh, the appreciation uh, that people have uh, about games as a potential career. For example, most of our kids don't realise that we're one of the leading companies in t uh, countries in terms of computer games and visual special effects industries. Only 3% of young people uh, know that Grand Theft Auto and SingStar were made in the UK. More significantly, they don't know what skills are needed to succeed in these industries, even though some of them recognise them as p potential uh, future careers. Only 3% of kids think that maths is the most important subject for video games or vi visual uh, effects. Next to none think that physics is important. The importance of art is underappreciated as well. So it remains the case that very low numbers recognise the importance of STEM subjects like maths and physics. I'm really looking forward to seeing the recommendations that the review puts forward, but I also put out the challenge to industry and academia alike. Unless industry, government and schools work closely together on this, we'll miss our opportunity. I think it comes from the fact that I don't want to see a generation of kids coming out who are expert 
at word processing but know nothing about computer programming. We want to inspire people and equip them with the skills to make the next word processor or the next compu hit computer game. The goal is simple, to become one of the best sources of talent in the world. I hope it's pretty clear from uh, my remarks that I'm a massive fan of the use of technology in schools to aid learning of every kind. I don't come from the political school of thought that uh, video games are the root of all evil. I think they're a massive opportunity across a whole range of sectors, not least in the classroom. And it strikes me as slightly bizarre that there should be this fear of technology in the classroom when all of us here use technology, the mobile phone, email, texting, the iPad and so on, to make our working lives easier, and yet we don't think it's appropriate to make it easier for kids to learn at school. I'm lucky enough to have RM in my constituency, and every so often I go in to see their classroom of the future, and I'm not depressed that there's no blackboard or chalk. I'm excited by the interactive whiteboards, the tabletop computers, the engineering models that could and should be available in schools today. I'm excited by the kind of technology, frankly, that allows a quadriplegic to type and participate uh, in the classroom. Because that's another side of the coin that we shouldn't forget. The scope that digital technologies offer to support learning is a hugely important theme in my work on e-accessibility, both in the classroom and the workplace and in daily life. We launched an e-accessibility action plan last October, and I'm proud that the UK is at the forefront of, wor of working to deliver accessibility across a wide range of platforms. Digital inclusion has support from the highest levels of government. Jeremy Hunt and myself, the digital champion Martha Lane Fox, have all expressed our strong support for the e-accessibility forum and its work. Digital technologies have huge scope to impact on people who have previously exclude, been excluded from opportunities to learn, to play, or to socially interact. And so the forum is looking, for example, at how innovations in the video games industry can be used to help disabled and older people take part in education and other walks of life. And a great example of this, since I'm plugging uh, local companies, is Special Effect, uh, based in the Prime Minister's constituency, uh, which has a star, its Stargaze pilot project, a groundbreaking, groundbreaking project that offers eye control technology, enabling people who have suffered paralysis to operate a computer for communication, independence, work and leisure. So there is quite a lot already happening this year. The work with eSkills on computer clubs, the Livingston Hope Review on skills, but also the digital and creative industry section of the government's growth review, which will put video games at their core. We need to continue to be excellent in this field. For the UK to continue to compete on the world stage in the digital and creative industries, we need to continue to produce the talent and then provide an environment for it to flourish. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, very much indeed for that. And I know we, we've got about 10 minutes now for some questions, and I know there'll be a lot of questions in the audience. I'm just grabbing my water. Okay. I'll ask a question to your back uh, while trying to adjust to these huge images of myself. It's frightening. Ed, um, thank you. I'll block them out. <clears throat> thank you very much for that. So I, I think there's, uh, there's one question that probably needs to be asked, which is that the government is very serious about games and education, and yet we don't have anybody here from the Department of Education at all, that Michael Gove or, or anybody from there. And um, I guess some people here might be worried that there's a mixed message there. Uh, <clears throat> no, I don't think there is a mixed message. I mean, uh, uh, dare I say that a lot of what happens in life is, con is cock up rather than conspiracy, so there may be various reasons why somebody from the Department of Education can't uh, be here. Uh, but I do, do know from my conversations with Michael Gove that he does recognise the importance of video games and video games technology in teaching kids subjects. And I know that he's met a few developers who have shown him uh, some of the uh, applications that you can use in order to facilitate learning. So I think Michael has an open mind. I don't think it's any secret that I think I'm probably the strongest advocate of video games technology uh, in terms of uh, ministers in this kind of space. And it's also my job as well to keep plugging away to ensure. But I think that... Um, uh, if 2010 was the year when we had to get our feet under the table and 
uh, organise the country's finances. 2011 is when we can start to do innovating, uh, innovative and exciting stuff, and I hope to do that with the Department for Education. Excellent. Um, and now I'd like to, we have some couple of roving mics, I think. Um, I'd like to try and take some questions from the floor. Do we have, do we have roving microphones? Um, okay. Uh, the gentleman there. Yeah, my name's Bob Penrose. I'm with AQA, the exam board up in Manchester. I've come to this for years and years and I've listened to people like you and the potential for technology in learning and education for all groups of people is fantastic. The problem we've got is that you hit a draconian and outdated exam system that still insists on 16 and 18 year olds being put through high pressure, stress, GCSE and A-levels that can make or break their whole career. Now, there's just this huge dichotomy between events like this and the potential of what we've got. And can you talk to your colleagues about how we might have the same transformation in the assessment system that still relies on kids getting qualifications to progress through? Uh, right, well, that's a very unhelpful question because it's not my brief, obviously, to uh, talk about exam qualifications. And obviously, Michael Gove has uh, set out his views on how qualifications go forward. I think there is an interesting uh, dilemma. I think um, psychologically, uh, you want kids to be tested, to pass uh, a test. And there's always, I think, naturally a suspicion of uh, module working, of kids being able to to go back and improve their work without being uh, tested in conditions where you know it's just them, as it were, up against the questions. Uh, I think that you know, what AQA and other exam boards have shown is how enormously, uh, what an enormous role technology can play across the spectrum of education. And I'm not talking here about games, I'm talking about assessment in the sense of being able to pinpoint uh, within a school where clearly there is a, uh, you know, something is going wrong. So you can look at a whole range of schools and see that, you know, the maths teacher is not doing a great job compared to similar schools or compared to results in other subjects. And you can go back and fix that. So I think that there's a great opportunity there. But I am, uh, I think, still too much of a conservative to want to get away uh, from testing completely. Uh, I do think that the other thing that, technology and assessment offers is the chance for kids to learn uh, at the right pace. I don't see any reason why, given what AQA and other exam boards can do. I mean, if I asked you to set me an English exam for tomorrow morning, you could now do that thanks to technology. So I don't see why, well, other exam boards can. Uh, so I don't see why uh, we couldn't do, why everyone has to, as it were, necessarily sit exams at exactly the same time on exactly the same date when technology can generate a specific exam paper for kids and they can learn at different paces and take, take different modules as and when they want to do that. Thank you, and I think we have time for, for two more questions if we try and keep them... Uh, keep, keep I've them got a lot of brief. Twitter questions here as well. Excellent. Well, who we, who you writes like Ed Vasey's speeches? Uh, well, uh, I got a draft and I rewrote it last night. Looks alarmingly like Ben Swain. Do I look like Ben Swain from the thick of it? <laughs> Keep going. Excellent. Still uh, amazed Ed Vasey showed up. <laughs> Twitter can such, be cruel. Such a massive contrast between Ed Vasey and Tom Watson. The latter was actually genuinely interested in gaming. Not so the lesson is the trouble think with Twitter is nobody, nobody ever posts a compliment on Twitter, do they? They don't get no, They do about you, Tom. I'll look you up on Twitter. They, they call me Tim, I think. It's got no in. It's got no. Uh, can we have one there, please, the gentleman? Can we have a mic down here? You can use my one. Let me give it back. Thanks. Um, my name is Graham Garner. Ed, I'm one of your constituents and have been for a few years. So it's good to see you here today. So I'll stand up so you can see me a bit better. Um, I, uh, I, I'm encouraged very much by your comments relating to technology and education. However, when Michael produced his white paper last year, 95 pages, there wasn't one mention of the word computing, ICT, or technology. Um, <laughs> And I've heard strong rumours that Nick Gibb is even more uh, away from that agenda than, uh, than Michael might be. 
Um, so I, I just want to implore you, please, on behalf of me as one of your constituency and also representing all the schools in the country, could you please talk to him about why technology is important in the 21st century to teach in our schools? Uh, well, I always do what my uh, constituents ask me to do. So uh, you can take that as read. And judging from the mood of this conference, I think I'll be lynched if I don't. So I certainly will do. And we've got time for, for just one more burning question if I could, from a different part of the room. Anyone got a question? Yes. Um, hello, Dawn Hallibone. Um, I'm a teacher using games in school. Um, following on from the comment about the education, um, I'd love us all to be innovative in classrooms. Harnessing technology grant has been cut. Um, I know the finances are there, you know, are not there so much now, but if you're saying that technology is important and we need to innovate, where are the funds going to come from and where will the support be from your department for us? Uh, well, I've got in the Department for Education, so thank you to the person who's tweeted uh, out of his depth talking about education, because I'm not in the Department for uh, Education. I look after video games as uh, the creative industries, but my interest is in uh, skilling up kids and students to work uh, in that industry and to work in uh, the creative industries. I mean, my understanding is that uh, Michael Gove got rid of a quango uh, vector, which was not necessarily... Uh, in his view, value for money. It wasn't saying there shouldn't be any technology in schools. It was saying that you didn't necessarily need to purchase that technology centrally. And, you know, I don't want to get into the debate about the future of that quango because I'm bound to say something wrong, but my impression was that there were people on both sides of that debate, people who were pleased to see it go, who wanted to see, have the freedom uh, to get the technology they thought was appropriate for their classroom, uh, and people who felt it did a good service, as you'd expect from... Uh, any organisation uh, that was abolished, it had its critics uh, and its allies. But what the thrust of uh, Michael Gove's reforms are to push budgets down to schools and to give schools uh, the freedom to purchase the services they think they need. So uh, I think one feels as a politician, you can't do this job on your own. If, you, if you're passionate about technology in schools, uh, then you need advocates in the schools as well, fighting for their share uh, of the budget, so I think that's important. But I do think that it's important that I work with the Department for Education uh, to look at this whole issue of how you get kids into technology. As I say, the strong feeling I have, and you're very welcome to say it's wrong uh, as well as ag agree with it, is that, as I say, I think kids are ahead of their teachers. It's just a fact of life. They tend to use technology in a much more natural way, especially if they're exposed to it at a relatively young age. And so the reason I want to set up, as it were, computer clubs for schools to look at how we can do learning outside the classroom is not a criticism of teachers, it's a recognition that you're more likely to find the latest technology. You're also more likely to find the mentors, the people who are working in the industry, uh, in those places, and to fire up the kids who are interested in technology. And the other debate we had at this round table is, is, the, is this a prescription to take the kids who are interested in technology, just as you might take a kid who's interested in learning the violin and taking their skills and skilling them up? Or is it a prescription to try and get every kid interested in technology? Now, I don't think you can force every kid to be interested in technology, just as you can't force every kid to be interested in uh, music or Latin or whatever other subject you choose to pick out of a hat. So that's, I would see these computer clubs as being a place where you take kids who have an interest in technology and want to pursue it.